This is a Pro Modified, arguably the most popular, competitive, and diverse professional class in all of drag racing. This is Bounty Drag Racing, Drag Racing Evolved. It's a brand new drag racing game on PC, available on Steam, and set for a full release in just a couple weeks. In this video, I'm going to show you how to build and tune a competitive Pro Mod. I'll show you all the important stuff you need to get started racing one of these for yourself. We'll go into everything from game settings, tune-ups, to data analysis, and we'll not only build a race car capable of running in the 5.6 second range, I'll show you what you need to know to be able to adapt it to the game's ever-changing weather and track temperatures. So, you're able to make it down the racetrack consistently, no matter what the conditions are. But at the end of this, whether you're brand new to the sport, or a seasoned veteran of drag racing games past, you'll know everything you need to so you can get started and join in on the action with this growing community of competitive online drag racers and find out for yourself why these cars are so popular all around the world. So welcome everybody to Bounty Drag Racing in the first and possibly only session of Rookie Impossible Returning Veterans with some random curious and bored people's introduction to video game Pro Modified Racing 101. We'll call it Pro Mods for Dummies for short. I'm Professor Idiot and today's class starts right here at the first thing you'll see when you fire up the game. We'll assume that this is not your first video game and we won't spend time going through graphic options and stuff today. Instead we'll head to the control settings. This game works with a steering wheel, game controllers, and keyboard and mouse. Whichever of those you choose, you'll want to take a moment to make sure you've mapped all the essentials. For those unfamiliar with drag racing and this game, the controls should work much the same as with any other game involving cars. But you're going to need a button for a trans brake and one to toggle burnout mode. Here's a tip for the rookies and veterans alike. If you assign and add the same buttons for neutral gear that you use to start the engine and deploy the chutes with, you'll never have to downshift through the gears between runs again. With your control set up, you'll want to head over to the garage to pick your car. Bounty Drag Racing comes with a pretty decent number of classes to choose from. It even includes a paint shop with enough tools and features to create some pretty sweet looking race cars. For today's video, we'll be using the Pro Modified Camaro, although not this one. I thought I would show you around the paint shop for a quick moment. As I took the liberty of painting us a custom car just for this occasion. The paint shop allows you to just spray away with any color you want. It comes with enough textures, stickers, decals, and letters to create just about whatever you could imagine. Now, let's go test. For today's class, we're going to set up our own room to test in so we can have the track all to ourselves. The game currently has 5 locations to choose from, with varying distances and track prep levels bringing us 8 choices of where or how to race. We will be going to Straight Line Media Raceway and running a full quarter mile. One of the really cool things about Pro Mods that make it so appealing is the number of possible engine and car combinations. Bounty Drag Racing gives you a choice of all the engine combinations you would associate with the class and then some. The most popular choices include blowers, centrifugal superchargers, nitrous oxide, and turbochargers. While each combination presents its own challenges to set up, tune, and drive, there doesn't seem to be any major performance advantages between them. For this video, we'll be using the big block nitrous combination. So, the first thing we're going to do is go into the engine swap options in the tuning menu, choose the big block nitrous motor, and click apply. You'll notice the nitrous control option added to the tuning menu and a hood scoop sitting on top of the car. Now we'll need to load a setup, so we'll go back into the tuning screen and at the top you'll find a handful of default setups for various classes. We're going to load the default pro modified setup. Click apply, close the tuning menu, and we're ready to go make our first hit. We'll keep things moving as quickly as we can and have the car towed to the lanes. 
Straight Line Media Raceway is the largest racetrack in the game at this point with big open staging lanes that make it easy to pull through and prepare for your runs. This isn't the case with all the tracks though, so be prepared to take some time figuring out the best way to get into the various burnout boxes throughout this game. From inside the car, this burnout box feels like a slippery bump you drive over. And while you can switch through the spectator cameras to see where your wheels are, there's nothing else to indicate if you're in the correct position. I would love to see a crewman standing to the side that could put a hand up when your slicks are in the water, but as it is, it's very difficult to perform a proper burnout if you don't start it in the water, so you'll want to pay attention to that. With the car in position, I'll turn on burnout mode, hold the brake about halfway, and put my foot down. Once the tires get spinning and the RPMs come up, I'll release the brake and keep my foot in and across the starting line, before lifting and bringing the car to a stop. As you begin reversing, you can turn off burnout mode. Doing well in drag racing is largely about perfecting a routine. The more consistent a driver can be in all aspects, the easier it is to just tune the car around the weather and track conditions. If you're staging the car with vastly different tire temperatures, or you're shifting at different points in the run, you're not going to learn much about what the car actually needs. Now, we watch a tree, the top blue semicircle says I'm pre-staged, Staged, hold trans brake, floor it, go. Through the gears, throw the chutes, and we just run a 620 at 245 miles per hour to start things off. At this point you can drive it off the end of the track if you choose, or hit escape to bring up the option to tow it back to the pits, and we'll do just that. Now, just like real racing I suppose, here's a bit of an annoying part of our routine here, and I recommend doing it as soon as you're back in the pits, and that's repairing your race car. It's cool to see how much wear you put on the parts each pass, but that means clicking on the repair or replace buttons after every run. Now, let's go have a look at that tune-up. I suspect from the way the RPMs fell flat in 4th gear, that the default setup we're using is built with a blower combination in mind as they usually run 3 speeds, while well, the nitrous cars run 4 or 5 most commonly. With the first 3 gears set to 2.6, 2 and 1.7, we'll make a reasonable guess and set 4th gear to something usable. Besides clicking the arrows to change your tuning values in various increments, you're also able to click the box itself and type the number you want to really fine tune it. So with that, we'll set 4th gear to 1.55, apply it and hit the lanes for run number 2. All of the cars and combinations in this game behave differently during the burnout. Some need time to build boost, some need time to build wheel speed, and others you can just drive through and put the hammer down. It might take a bit of time in experimenting to get it right, but it's worth learning. Here we go. That sounds a lot better, how about a 5.87 at 258 miles per hour? Nearly a half second and a 13 mile per hour improvement from our first setup change. I only wish the rest would come so easily. Let's go back to the tuning menu and have a look at the data logger. While it may look confusing if you're not familiar with something like this, we're only really going to be looking at a few things here between runs. And you're able to turn off a lot of this stuff to make it easier to see. The two we want to look at most here are the red line representing RPMs and the light blue line indicating clutch engagement. With the red line, ideally we would like to see a smooth building in RPMs off the line and consistent and relatively even shift points. On a good pass, the RPM shouldn't drop below 6000 from second gear on. On this pass, we had an evenest spacing through the gears, and in a good RPM range, it was just a complete dog off the line, it didn't actually build any RPM for more than a second. For comparison, let's look at the graph from a 5.50, mile per hour pass made in similar conditions, and you can see just how much quicker it run through the first couple gears. You wouldn't need to see either run, or even a time slip to know which of these two runs was better. For this pass we'll go to the drivetrain settings, the first thing we'll do is lower the clutch engagement RPM to make it a bit easier to inch the car forward on the starting line. 
Then we'll go to the engine tuning menu, but we'll raise the RPM that the shift light comes on and launch the car at 6500 instead of 4500 RPMs to hopefully get it off the line quicker. Let's take it to the track and see how it goes. Well, that didn't go great. We actually slowed to a 615 at 256 miles per hour. Let's have a look at what went wrong on that pass. The obvious thing that stands out is that we still haven't slowed the launch and late clutch engagement problem. We also now have this big dip where it briefly but entirely disengages at the top of first gear. I'm not entirely sure why that is, but one thing at a time here, and I think it's most important just to get this pig moving off the line. We'll go to the transmission settings and bring our first gear ratio all the way up to 3 and the second gear to 2.1 and we'll see if that cleans things up a bit. Well, it was still a bit sluggish through first gear and a dog in fourth and we only managed at 6.05 but we learned from every pass and it was slightly better than the run before. Looking at this, it appears all we really solved that last pass was to move this sudden clutch disengagement to later in the run, where it was slightly less detrimental to the ET. So obviously, if we're having clutch issues, we should maybe go try something different in the clutch. We'll go to the drivetrain settings and drop the variable engagement from 2000 to 1000 and go see what happens. Well, that was garbage off the line, and I'm pretty sure it skipped right past second gear, but we still somehow managed to run a 608 at 230 miles per hour. I think we made too large of a change to the variable engagement RPM that last pass to safely say that lower isn't better until we've tried a more reasonable adjustment size. So we'll bring that halfway back to where it was, and then go have a look at the data. This is actually a better looking graph if we ignore the horrible job I did shifting the car. The clutch engaged considerably sooner and stayed engaged. Let's have a look at the drivetrain settings again. I think if we slow down the clutch engagement just a bit more than it currently is, it might allow the RPMs to come up properly through first gear, and we'll lower the slip torque just a bit to get some of the power to the ground. Now we'll see about fixing this uneven RPM range between third and fourth gear. It's hard to say if second gear is at the right ratio since we didn't really use it on that last run. So for now, we'll assume it's okay and just lower third gear to 1.6 and fourth gear half as much down to 1.5 to keep the revs in the sweet spot and we'll go make another hit. at 5.78 at 257 miles per hour. It didn't sound all that lively, but we are getting a lot closer to where we want to be. We're still getting a late clutch engagement, but it looks like we have the gearing spaced out more or less correct. We're just not using an aggressive enough final drive ratio to get through them all. It's possible the clutch isn't engaging quickly enough because we're essentially stalling the car on the hit. So, we'll change the final drive ratio from 1.9 to 2.1 and bring it to the line once again. Bouncing the rev limiter at the top of second gear, it's still going through with a 5.70, 257 miles per hour. Let's look at the data again. You see the clutch is finally engaging much quicker, although still not perfect. What we're looking at here is a large RPM drop between first and second, and this flat spot between second and third. The drop off between first and second would normally be a sign of either too much first gear or too little second. However, in this case, you can see that the first second shift happened about a thousand RPMs early, and had I run it out a little bit more through first, this drop might not have been half as large. More concerning is this flat spot. If you're not gaining RPM, you're not accelerating. What we'll do here is bring third gear up to 1.65 from 1.6 to shorten the gap from second while at the same time creating a little more space between third and fourth. If I drive it correctly this time, it should run better. A 
257 mile per hour pass. The car is slowly coming around. Let's have a quick look at the data from that pass and then I'll show you how to adapt what we've built here to work in whatever conditions get thrown at us. As we can see, we finally have the RPMs in the sweet spot nearly the entire run, with the largest drop happening between first and second gears, but as I predicted, running through first gear longer made that considerably less dramatic than it looked after the pass before this. We still have a little bit of a flat spot in third, but even that's not so bad. Once you've gotten a mostly working setup, you can smooth out any of these little trouble spots through playing around in the ignition mapping a bit and a few other things. For this video, we want to keep things as simple as possible, and now we have a decent race car, so let's find out how to keep it working well. You may not have noticed, but even as we've been working away on this car for this video, just like in the real world, the weather and track conditions have been slowly and constantly changing. When we made our first runs, it was 108 degrees Fahrenheit with a density altitude of about 3425 feet. As we sit here now, it's dropped to 106 degrees, and the density altitude is now 3330 feet and falling. So what does that mean and why is it important? Most high powered race cars, this one included, make more horsepower and torque than you're ever able to use or put down on the racetrack. If we brought this car to the line with the ignition and nitrous mapping set to max and the drivetrain set to put it all down, should the engine even survive, we're going to succeed at nothing but a smoky quarter mile burnout. The trick of course is in knowing how much power a race car is going to take at any given time and how to apply as much of that as possible without overpowering the track. Most of the fully prepped tracks in this game seem to provide similar traction levels in similar conditions, but like we've seen even here, the conditions change constantly and so do the traction levels, and without the ability to go stand on the starting line and twist their feet in the rubber, it's the temperature that will provide us with the best clue to how grippy it is. Tracks should tend to have the best grip at temperatures between 85 and 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Cooler tracks tend to be more tight and tricky, while hotter tracks tend to be a little greasy. Above and below that, you have less grip and the track won't take as much of your horsepower. Besides all of your various engine settings, the amount of power your engine is actually producing at any given time will change along with the temperature, humidity, and air pressure. These are the factors that determine what the overall density altitude is. You don't get the combustion in an internal combustion engine without both fuel and oxygen. The more oxygen you have available, the more fuel you're able to burn, and the more horsepower you're able to make. We all know that the higher we get above sea level, the thinner the air gets. Since thinner air contains less oxygen, the higher we are in altitude, the less horsepower our engine will make. As of right now, we have a working pro mod in which the last two passes we made were 5.70 and 5.68 second ET. Now we're going to speed up time progression a bit and bring us to a different part of the day with some different conditions. Track temperature is now over 20 degrees cooler and the density altitude is more than a thousand feet lower. Looking at these conditions, given what I just talked about, we should expect the track to be pretty tight and our engines to be making a little bit more horsepower. We won't change anything just yet, instead we're going to find out just how much of a difference these conditions really make. A 610 at 224 miles per hour. I'm not sure if it dead hooked or maybe the clutch was too tight through first, but it took a really long time to build RPM. Then once it did, it powered through the rest of the gears so quickly, I had to use a fifth gear, which we didn't actually set up to use. With a tighter starting line and more available power, our 5.68 second setup came off the line like a pig and then blew through the gears. So, well, not to do that again, we'll lower the final drive ratio from 2.1 to 2. We'll add a little more clutch slip to see if it helps us get through first gear a little quicker. There we go, a 5.75 at 258 miles per hour, so we look at the data. Although we ran okay there, you see the clutch disengaged at the top of first and second gear. I suspected I made a mistake changing the slip torque, so we'll return that to 2700, and instead we'll see if we can clean things up in the ignition mapping. Each of these lines represent half second increments starting at zero. The higher the bar in each increment is, the more power you're producing at that part of the run. Ideally with the pro mods, I find they work better when you have a smoother ramping of the ignition timing. To compensate for the tighter track, we're going to get a little more aggressive right at the hit, and then just sort of space out the rest of these to hopefully make for a smoother run. Now, let's take one more shot at these conditions and see what happens. 
Remember, this is a known 5.68 second tune-up, running a lower final drive ratio and slightly more aggressive and smoother ignition mapping. How about that, another 5.68 at 259 miles per hour. While I would call that a success, we're not quite done just yet. We're going to make two more passes for um, science. As silly as that might sound, it's really not. Science is about testing and experimenting and being able to make accurate predictions based off an accumulation of results. To see if we actually learned anything here today or we just got lucky, we're going to need to perform one more test. We're going to, want to advance the time again to bring us another noticeable change in conditions and make two more runs. When we completed our last pass, it was 81 degrees and the density altitude was just over 2200 feet. Now, we're looking at 68 degrees and a density altitude of just over 1500 feet. With cooler temperatures and more available horsepower, if we take the car down the track again as it is, much like before, if we even make it off the line properly, we should expect it to at least blow through all the gears too quickly again and likely not run as well as before. Just like we should expect, needing a fifth gear that just wasn't there and running a 5.78 at 241 miles per hour. You can see here it made it through first and second pretty well before a big drop into third with very little drop going into fourth. So for our final pass, we'll raise third gear just a bit, add a usable fifth gear and go send it. There we go, another 5.68 in our first 260 mile per hour pass. That will wrap up Pro Mod for Dummies 101. We built a pretty decent running car here, and from what we've learned, we should be able to keep it that way. I really hope you enjoyed this, and I hope it was helpful for those of you interested in giving this a try. If you did enjoy it, please hit that thumbs up so YouTube knows that this is worth watching, and if you're into this stuff, subscribe to my channel for more. I hope to do a lot more with this game here soon. Thank you all for watching. See you in the lanes.